Hi, welcome back to Chemistry with Mrs. Mays. Today we're going to look at orbital diagrams, also known sometimes as Aufbau diagrams. So as the number of electrons increases, so does the repulsion between them. That causes their energy to go up. Complex atoms that are more complicated than hydrogen contain more than one electron. So interactions between electrons must be accounted for in the energy levels. The energy of electrons depends on both the energy level or the distance from the nucleus and the orbital shape. Some orbitals are more crowded than others, right? In multi-electron atoms then, the orbitals that are on the same energy level no longer are equal in energy because each subshell has a different amount of repulsions between electrons. So we have to have a separate space to show that a 2s has a different kind of repulsion than a 2p. And these orbitals are going to overlap somewhat. The energy depends on both the energy level and the orbital shape, so there's some overlap where one shape gets a little bit too high. So here's where we see the 3D coming in, filling in after the 4S has already been filled. So we put electrons in 4S first before we fill in 3D, and that's why the periodic table is structured the way it is. 4S comes before 3D, but the D spreads the electrons out more, so its energy level is called a 3, not a 4. We represent this with Aufbau diagrams, or we call these orbital diagrams, where each box or line in the diagram represents one specific orbital. So we have only one type of S in energy level one, one type of S in energy level two, but in energy level two, we could have two types of P, the P that's along the x-axis, the P that's along the y-axis, or the P that's along the z-axis. Those are the three different orientations the P orbital could have. Orbitals that are on the same subshell are always drawn together. So I put their boxes touching, then we use arrows to represent the electrons. And the arrows show the direction of the relative spin, either positive or negative of the electron. So for oxygen, we would draw f the first electrons in the s orbital because we start with the lowest energy level and we fill that one first. Then we completely fill up the 2s with its two electrons. Then as we get into the p electrons, I'm going to fill in all of the electrons spinning the same direction first. We're going to give every orbital an electron before anybody gets to pair up. So I need eight electrons for oxygen. That means I should have eight arrows in my picture. Here's two, four, six, seven, eight electrons. And just like at a birthday party, you get to have one cupcake until every kid gets one. And only then do you get to have seconds. So in the P section, every orbital gets an electron before anybody partners up. Let's go over these rules. I showed them, but I want you to know what they are for sure. The one that we follow first is the Aufbau principle. This means electrons are added to the lowest or energy orbital that's available until all the electrons of the atom have been accounted for. So we start with the lowest energy and build up to the highest. The Pauli exclusion principle states that an orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons each. And to occupy the same orbital, they must spin in opposite directions or they don't get to be in the same orbital at the same time. Finally, there's Hund's rule. Hund's rule tells us that electrons occupy equal energy orbitals 
so that the maximum number of unpaired electrons results. So we don't get to pair things up until every orbital has an electron in it. So let's look at the Aufbau diagram as we talk about these rules. And the Aufbau means building up. That's a word in German that means to build up. This technique was developed by Niels Bohr and Wolfgang Pauli. When they were studying electrons, they noticed the electrons have to go in the lowest energy levels first. That's what Aufbau means. They go in the lowest energy levels first. So we can call this an Aufbau diagram or an orbital diagram. The Pauli exclusion principle was the idea that no two electrons in the same atom can have exactly the same energy. So if they're going to be in the same shell, in the same subshell, then they have to spin in opposite directions. If an electron is spinning down in an orbital, the next electron to fill it must spin up or they can't be in the same space at the same time. So here's the correct way to write an Aufbau diagram, an orbital diagram for boron. An incorrect way would be to put the two electrons spinning in the same direction. That would not be okay. They can't be in that space together. And Hund's rule tells us that every orbital in a subshell is singly occupied with one electron before any orbital is doubly occupied. All electrons in singly occupied orbitals will have the same spin. So as we're putting one electron in each orbital, they're all going to spin in the same direction first. Here's our 2p, where I put one arrow on each individual line first before I put them in the same line. Here's how it would look when it's incorrect. They're in the same space, and it would be wrong to put both of them there without having an electron in the other orbitals first. So let's show the Aufbau diagram for the element magnesium. If you'll find it on your periodic table, magnesium is element number 12. So I need a place for 12 electrons and I'm going to draw like half arrows to make things go faster. So I fill in the S orbitals first. I start at the bottom and work my way up. And then in the P section, I'm going to put all of my arrows spinning the same direction first before I go back and pair them up. So now, how many electrons do we have? I have 6 plus 2 is 8, and 2 more is 10. I need 12 total because magnesium's atomic number is 12. So I can put two more electrons, and then I have to be done because now I've represented a place for every electron in the atom magnesium. Now let's fill in the orbital diagram for iron. Iron is element number 26. I need a place for 26 electrons. Iron is in the center of the periodic table in the top row. So first we fill in the lower energy levels first. Then we singly occupy every orbital in the subshell before doubly occupying those energy levels, those orbitals. Then S gets to have two. The P gets singly occupied first and then we fill in the next ones. One electron spinning up and one spinning down. We're almost done because I'm up to 20 electrons now. I have only six more. So I put one, two, three, four, five, and I need one more to fill in 3D so I can have 26 total electrons. So notice all of the S orbitals are arranged in the same column in my diagram. All of the p orbitals are arranged in the same space. Then we put the d orbitals. And then if we have f orbitals, they would have to fill in this space over here. This is how we keep our diagrams organized. Sometimes you'll see us writing it all out in a straight line like we did for oxygen. But for something that's complicated, um, like iron, we may want to show how the energy is increasing as we go. Sometimes you'll see 
a diagram in the excited state. For example, this electron has moved out of the 3s and all the way up to a 3p. This represents an element called sodium, and in a sodium vapor lamp, the electrons of the sodium are promoted to the 3p level because they get excited by an electrical discharge. We send electricity through it, and that causes their energy to increase. And so they emit yellow light as they return from where they got promoted to, and they go back to where they should be. They have to release that energy and when we see that energy, it has the wavelength that we associate with yellow light. So a lot of street lights or headlights on cars use sodium vapor, and that's why they appear to have a yellowish color. Now there are some exceptions to the way we fill in the orbitals, because half-filled orbitals are more stable than partially filled orbitals. So let's look at the predicted orbital diagram for the element chromium. Chromium is element number 24 on the periodic table. So I would normally fill in all of my arrows for chromium. And we want to put in 24 electrons, so I need 24 arrows to get it done. And if I put it the way I would normally put, I would have four electrons in the d orbital. And that leaves this space right here empty. So if I had just one more electron there, I could make the whole thing much more stable. And so that's what chromium does. It steals an electron out of the 4s, where it's more crowded, and moves it to the 3d, where there's now less crowding. So I take that electron out of the 4s, and I move it over to the 3d spot. So now chromium is going to look like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, then 4s1, 3d5, because that half-filled or com or um, yeah, because the half-filled orbital is much more stable than the partially filled orbital. So chromium can gain stability by moving only one electron, not two, moving one electron from 4s to 3d. So the actual orbital diagram for chromium looks a little bit different from what we would normally predict. You'll find similar configurations for all of the elements in the chromium family because whatever energy level they're in, they're going to end up in the same situation with needing one more electron here. So the chromium family includes molybdenum, chromium of course, molybdenum, uh, tungsten, and cyborgium. And then the copper family is going to have something similar as well, because copper would end up with all of these filled as well and have only one more electron to stick right here. That's what copper would need to do. So they take one out of the S and put it into the D. So the copper family all acts the same way. They gain a lot of stability by filling in an S orbital in the D section. So that would be copper, silver, and gold, and this gives these elements, these metals, an unusual stability, so they're less reactive, and we find them in nature, in their pure form, a lot more commonly than the other metals on the periodic table. And learn the exceptions in the D section, in the transition metals, you'll also find a lot of elements in the F block have exceptions, but I won't make you know which ones those are until you're in AP chemistry, because for now, it's good enough to, to just know the basic ones, the more common ones. Great, so we'll practice in class, and I will see you guys soon.